So please. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Tae Kim. Uh, I'm from the University of Notre Dame in uh, U.S., not in Paris, in or France. Uh, so forgive me if I'm saying as a Notre Dame, not Notre Dame. <laughs> uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, detection of pairwise hotspots on the CMB through deep neural network. Uh, so first. Um, Marco gave a great uh, introduction about cosmic inflation, uh, and this is uh, basically we think it's a, it's a, a common paradigm of explaining the seed uh, that seeds the fluctuations on uh, CMB and uh, large scale structure. Uh, one thing that we are actually um, focusing on here is that inflaton, uh, inflation being the scale invariant. Actually, we are going to violate that. So what it means is that there is a specific time frame there we're going to uh, produce this kind of uh, probe heavy particle production uh, during this inflation, where mass is way larger than the Hubble scale. Uh, and the, uh, as a result, there will be the localized signals actually appear in this position space. Uh, and then this signal detection can be done uh, either position space or uh, in the power spectrum level. So both position or momentum space can be possible. Um, uh, my uh, main focus is that using machine learning as a tool uh, so that we can pluck out those signals. Uh, this is a schematic of the particle production. As I mentioned, uh, this pairwise uh, massive particle gets produced as a at a specific time frame. And then um, this particle actually modifies and then creates the curvature perturbation uh, as shown over here. Then later, uh, this production uh, particle actually gets, fro uh, perturbation gets frozen because it is, uh, uh, it's created during the inflation, so the Hubble uh, Hubble radius gets uh, sh uh, smaller and smaller during inflation. That's why it gets frozen until it re-enters the horizon. And then once it re-enters the horizon, uh, it uh, gets uh, effects from the its surrounding, and then the, uh, the profile gets modified. Then later uh, uh, on the CMB, it actually creates some sort of uh, hotspot or cold spot signatures. Uh, the way to incorporate this um, uh, violation of the time variance is that uh, using this specific model. Uh, here, we are actually opening up the portal between the inflaton and the heavy particle. And from here, we can see basically that we are cluing that uh, pairwise production is actually happening. Uh, then this ultra heavy particle is, uh, since it is directly coupled, and then because uh, as inflaton rolls, the field value changes, uh, this actually the effective mass term gets uh, minimized at some specific time frame. Uh, this, when we think, uh, we think is a, that's the maximum produ production of this heavy particle happens. Uh, I'll go more in slightly more detail in the how this particle gets produced. Uh, the way to understand it is uh, actually looking at this equation, the motion of this particle, uh, sigma. Uh, with some proper variable substitution, uh, which is u, uh, we can see the this once we clean out the mass, uh, it gets simply becoming the simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, one thing to notice here is that the uh, the frequency actually is a time dependent. So uh, when we look at the parabolic shape of the harmonic oscillator, it actually uh, starts to deform depending on the time. Uh, and then how much it deforms uh, at a given time is uh, depending on the when we calculate the violation of the adiabaticity, which is uh, omega prime over omega square. Uh, it gets maximized when uh, effective mass becomes uh, minimized. Uh, another way to look at it is because this uh, potential, parabolic potential, is uh, time dependent, uh, and then it gets maximally shifted at some specific uh, time frame. Uh, when the mass of the sigma gets minimized. Uh, we can think of it as, uh, for the most of the time, uh, the, ground, uh, the sigma is in actually in the ground state, which is which, uh, saying that there is no uh, sigma present. But as the potential dramatically shifts at the specific time frame, uh, the old uh, ground state is actually not the new ground state. It is actually the uh, linear combination of the excited and the ground state. So this actually uh, uh, a way to view uh, how the particle production happens. 
uh, detailed particle production can be also expressed in Golikov transformation, which I'm not going to explain too much in detail because I don't have much time. But uh, the point here is that at the specific time frame, the for initial um, creation and annihilation operator can be expressed and as a later time uh, uh, creation and annihilation operator, and this can actually constrain. Uh, we can actually use this formulation to calculate the number density of the theory, uh, number density of this heavy particle, uh, and then we can put some back, uh, back reaction constraints. Uh, yeah, back reaction constraint because we don't want to uh, stop the inflation because we produce too much, it's gonna basically stop the inflation from happening. Uh, so this is, uh, I will basically skip all of those uh, profile uh, so, bottom line of this profile is that uh, it actually gives the exponential shape uh, by doing that uh, particle gets pr uh, produced and then it get back reacts to the space time and then it curves. Uh, and then once we calculate, the, uh, it gives a non trivial uh, rise to the one point function, uh, which later gets uh, reduced into the exponential like. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the bottom line is that uh, the uh, primordial curvature perturbation from this uh, heavy particle production it looks like this, and then uh, because it has two peaks, because it's produced as a pair. Uh, this is not the end of the story. We have to use the Sachs-Wolf and then integrated Sachs-Wolf effects so that uh, it, uh, it can be projected into the CMB surface, uh, less scattering surface. Uh, the bottom line is it looks like this. There are two central peaks, and then there are some decaying modes. The detection method, we are actually using convolutional neural network. Uh, this is, uh, mimics the, how human sees uh, things. Uh, for example, it enhances some specific features. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> sorry for going <laughs> over, but um, what we are using is uh, using, we are training the network based on the small patch of uh, the background whether it has implanted signal or not, uh, and the network is trained to capture those. Uh, it is actually worked on the thing that is really faint. We cannot even see very well, even though the signal is implanted. Uh, it actually yields a pretty good signal capturing. Uh, it actually, at uh, G goes four, which is the inflaton coupling uh, with the uh, heavy particle is large and uh, small, uh, large, but the signal is faint. Uh, it, uh, yields a good signal capture. So that's all, and I'll let the... Uh, uh, we are actually trying to look into the uh, the actual Planck data at some point uh, to run this mat, uh, machine learning algorithm, scan over it uh, to see uh, we can set the bounds on the uh, training is done. Actually, um, there are, we are also trying like a traditional method using matched filter technique uh, to see if uh, it's. I think only one question. Depends on the chain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you need the mic? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So right now, um, uh, network-wise, uh, so since it's a well-controlled uh, scenario right now, uh, we are actually implanting the fake galaxies, uh, uh, faking the hotspot from the uh, faint uh, galaxy signal. That's also we have to implant it uh, to make it more realistic. So we are actually in the middle of the making it more real. But uh, right now, uh, if it is really idealistic, the background rejection is about 99%. So it's pretty good. Yeah. But again, it's there is a robustness of the uh, 
simulation versus the real. This? Okay. Uh, so primordial magnetic fields are a magnetic fields that are originated in the early universe. And uh, sorry, how I can show a, a pointer? <laughs> sorry, that time. So this is the pointer. Tuck. Ah, okay. You Thank you. To wait a second. Okay. Uh, so primordial magnetic fields are magnetic fields that are originated in the early universe and then evolving with our expanding universe during different phases of its cosmic evolution. And since these fields are originated in the early universe, they could affect uh, CMB, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, or could also produce gravitational waves. And at later times, they could also source, uh, they could also induce uh, re uh, earlier ionization of the universe. And for example, yes, yeah, so I, uh, I uh, show here this sketch from the uh, recent uh, studies where uh, it's shown that how, where the primordial magnetic field effects come. Uh, comes in CMB angular power spectrum, or if we uh, see also the evolution of uh, temperature of intergalactic medium, we would also see that with respect to standard scenario, primordial magnetic field would induce larger temperatures and therefore could also induce earlier ionization of the universe. So while talking about the importance of, primordial, of the studies of primordial magnetic fields, we wonder uh, where the hypothesis of primordial magnetic fields come from. And uh, observations show that not only planets and stars, but also galaxies and galaxy clusters are permeated by large-scale coherent fields, which are of the order of microgauss in galaxy clusters, and they are correlated at least on kiloparsec scales. And recent observations, uh, on blazer spectral observations have shown that they are compatible with non-zero magnetic fields in cosmic whites. And for example, here is shown these uh, black uh, dotted lines from uh, uh, observations, which are compatible with uh, non-zero magnetic fields. And actually, this type of observations put a, put a lower bound on the strength of magnetic fields in cosmic whites. So uh, there are uh, different generation scenarios how uh, primordial magnetic fields could be generated in the early universe. And they could be generated during inflation uh, or phase transitions. And in the inflationary scenario, their coherent scale would be unbound, while in the phase transitional scenario, their coherent scale is bounded by the Hubble horizon scale at the moment of generation. And in our work, we study both inflation and phase transition generated seed magnetic fields. And we evolve these fields from Redshift 50 uh, using the cosmological MHD code, ENZO. And we employ lambda CDM cosmology without cooling and feedback physics in order to solely focus on the evolution of primordial magnetic fields during structure formation and uh, amplification of these fields due to adiabatic processes. A novel approach of our work is that we, uh, we use the results of previous work, so we take into account evolution of these fields in the early universe, and we take the outcome of the MHD simulations with the pencil code as an initial conditions for our uh, cosmological simulations. So in particular, in our work, we ask a question, when looking at the magnetized cosmic web, can we distinguish between different primordial magnetogenesis scenarios? And here are the initial conditions of our simulations. 
So we study inflationary generated seed fields as a uniform magnetic field, which has a spectrum, just it's a constant and it's just Dirac delta function, picked at k equals, wave num uh, k equals zero wave number. And in the inflationary uh, scenario, we also study stochastic magnetic field, which has uh, turbulent spectra because it develops turbulent spectra during the evolution in the early universe, so from scale invariant spectra, it develops turbulent spectra. And here are shown this in the left two panels, our initial conditions, projected magnetic field strands. And we see that in the uniform case, it's just constant and directed along the diagonal, while in the scale invariant case, it's just, um, it is a stochastic distribution. And in the phase transition generated uh, seed magnetic fields case, we study stochastic fields, but as we see, their power spectra is different, so they have characteristic peak. And in uh, helical case, this characteristic peak is towards smaller wave numbers because helical fields would have larger co coherence scales after their evolution in the early universe. And yeah, so here are shown our initial coherence scales for different models. And here is the final picture, what we see after the evolution of these fields in the, uh, in, uh, during structure formation. And what we see actually that uh, 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 during structure formation, uh, final uh, distribution of magnetic field shows dependence on the initial topology of the magnetic field. So we see that the initially large scale fields, such as uniform and scale invariant models, would lead to larger, uh, largest amplitude in cosmic web and also largest coherence scales when compared, for example, to helical and non-helical models, which have initially smaller coherence scales. And also, if we look at the power spectra, this is also obvious from the uh, magnetic energy spectra. Here, y-axis show magnetic energy spectra and x-axis wave number. And these dash dotted lines are initial uh, spectra for stochastic models. And as we see on these very large scales, we see that uh, initially uh, inflation generated uniform and scale invariant models lead to largest amplitude uh, compared to phase transition generated helical and non-helical uh, models. And yeah, we can also study how the correlation length evolves during our uh, during structure formation, uh, which is actually defined here, and it's based on the magnetic energy spectra, which is Eb. And uh, if we look at the evolution of magnetic correlation lengths, here y-axis show magnetic energy correlation lengths and x-axis time, we see that at final redshift, we would obtain larger coherence scales, again, from inflation-generated acid magnetic fields compared to uh, phase transition-generated magnetic fields. And of course, we wonder also how we can observa observationally distinguish between these uh, magnetic fields, between these primordial magnetic fields. And, uh, yes. Uh, and I will briefly uh, uh, show our results from uh, Faraday rotation uh, study. So Faraday rotation effect is an, uh, so when polarized emission from a source passes through the magnetized plasma, its, uh, its initial interesting polarization plane is rotated. And this is the Faraday rotation effect. And this uh, change in the polarization plane is proportional to the so-called rotation measure and observed wavelength squared. And the rotation measure itself is an integrated quantity of electron number density and line of sight magnetic field strands and therefore traces line of sight magnetic fields. And we also studied this uh, rotation measure uh, from our uh, simulated uh, models. And what we find, we uh, see that uh, because of the initially uniform and scale invariant, initially large scale fields would give rise to larger amplitude in the uh, cosmic web, they would also show largest and uh, more correlated rotation measure values in the cosmic web. Um, yeah, so I, then I will not uh, say anything about conclusions and just leave this slide. <laughs> Yeah. 
based on their effect on the reionization history. Uh, yeah, so actually I think uh, what, uh, where we can, like apart from the rotation measure, which we also study and compare with our observations uh, from simulated, uh, it's also on CMB power spectrum, how you can, uh, if you can see, uh, well, actually, I think uh, that has not really been studied also. I co I like, it has not been studied what different topologies would lead in the CMB power spectra. Because usually people take either scaling variant model or just uniform model, and also in cosmological simulations. Uh, yeah, it's the first time we did different topology uh, of the magnetic field. But yeah, so that I think ha has not been done, but it would be interesting also. Sorry, if it's turbulence dominated? Evolution in our simulations? Yeah, so I, I cannot say that we really resolve turbulence in uh, our cosmological. So in, my, in our second project where we focus on galaxy clusters, there we employ higher resolution and then we focus on the, uh, on the amplification of magnetic fields um, from turbulence. But yeah, so in, uh, here in the simulations, we cannot really say uh, what is the effect from the turbulence. Hello? Okay. So there is a question from Zoom asking that are we choosing a special direction if we assume uniform field? Yeah, so yeah, as I showed, it's um, directed along diagonal and our simulations. And yeah, so it's uh, then, yeah, it has special direction in the simulations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. So many thanks. Hello, is it better? Yeah, okay. So uh, as she explained the primordial magnetic fields in a great detail, so I won't go in discussing about the primordial magnetic fields. So what we have done uh, in these, sorry, sorry. So this talk is based on these two uh, works. So in this work, uh, in uh, these work, what we have done is we have tried to uh, understand the problem of baryon symmetry by uh, uh, generating helical magnetic fields in the models, uh, basically in the infl uh, during inflation. So, uh, okay. So the observation suggests that there is a micro Gauss strength magnetic field which is coherence over a uh, kiloparsec uh, scale, and uh, on uh, we don't have still any understanding of the origin of magnetic field in the sense that we don't have uh, we do not have any uh, compelling theoretical models to explain uh, the origin of these magnetic fields uh, of such a large coherence length but a well accepted paradigm suggests that uh, these magnetic fields are generated uh, during inflation due to the quantum fluctuations of the gauge field and which has been later later amplified due to the uh, dynamo uh, mechanism or in amplification process and the we know from that uh, uh, there is a from these probes that uh, from BBN and the CMB probes that uh, there is a matter and antimatter asymmetry in the universe on large scale, and that asymmetry is characterized by uh, this uh, quantity eta b, which is a baryon baryon to photon number density, and this ratio is of the order of 10 to power minus 10. So. Uh, Sakharov suggested that uh, in, in this remarkable paper in 1967 that uh, in order to uh, create a baryon asymmetry in any particle theory model, one must satisfy these conditions independently, uh, like uh, baryon number violation, charge and charge parity violation, and departure from thermal equilibrium. So in this work, what we have done, we have tried to map these Sakharov's conditions with the symmetries of the universe in the presence of a magnetic field. So, in uh, this 1996 paper, 
Sasha Davidson pointed out an interesting relation between the primordial magnetic field and uh, uh, the Sakharov's condition. So, uh, due to the presence of a primordial magnetic field, there would be a uh, out of th uh, thermal equilibrium dynamics. And since magnetic field is odd under charge and charge parity violation, so uh, charge uh, parity symmetry, so there there would be a CP violation due to the presence of magnetic field. And since it is a uh, vector, so it will uh, have uh, it will break the isotropy also. But uh, interesting thing to notice is that the first two conditions uh, are same as the Sakharov's conditions. So uh, what we so this the baryon number violation uh, we cannot achieve in this uh, in uh, in this model. Uh, what uh, in in uh, the uh, the symmetries of uh, magnetic field in the presence of a primordial non-helical magnetic field. So for that, uh, in order to consistently map the uh, symmetries of the universe, we need a helical magnetic field and that is a, is a missing key ingredient in, in, in her model. So what we have done is that, uh, so to understand the helical magnetic field, uh, one can think about like uh, if uh, the electromagnetic field, the massless gauge field, uh, UN gauge field has two degrees of freedom. And these two degrees of freedom, if the propagation of these two degrees of freedom is different, uh, then they lead to a non-helical electromagnetic field. Now, uh, this baryon to uh, photon number density is related to the this Chern-Summon number density uh, by this relation one. And one can see that if a plus and a, a plus and a minus corresponds to the U and gauge field with a left, a right circular and left circular uh, polarization. So if both modes are uh, propagating differently, then we have this non-zero NCS, the transformer number density. And hence, that will create an imbalance between this baryon and antibaryon. So we, in this way, we, we can violate uh, this baryon number, uh, we can achieve this baryon number violation. So uh, this is the uh, missing ingredient in, uh, in our model. So, uh, now, with the helical magnetic field, uh, one can consistently map the symmetries of the universe with uh, uh, the Sakharov's conditions. Now, to achieve these uh, things in the model, uh, we have uh, considered this interaction term. Uh, so, due to the Riemann coupling, Riemann tensor, uh, which breaks the conformal invariance of the uh, action, and uh, this you can see that there is the F alpha, beta, and f mu nu tilde, where this tilde is nothing but the dual of the electromagnetic field tensor, which breaks the parity symmetry of the uh, uh, action. So, uh, and these two are the necessary conditions to generate the helical magnetic field. And uh, in this, uh, capital M is the energy scale of this uh, conformal breaking. So what we found is that uh, the, uh, the strength of the helical magnetic field on CMB scale is uh, 10 to power, uh, minus 14 Gauss, which is well below the uh, CMB uh, constant on the magnetic field, which is 10 to power uh, minus 9 Gauss. So now, uh, as I, show, I have shown earlier that uh, uh, this uh, gauge field uh, is related to the evolution of this gauge field is related to the baryon number density. So one can calculate uh, from this relation, the eta b, which is the baryon asymmetry parameter, and we found that this baryon asymmetry parameter uh, to yeah that. so uh, to have this uh, baryon asymmetry parameter in the uh, of the order of ten to the power minus ten, uh, these are the ranges of uh, capital M and reheating temperature which are allowed, so which is which are uh, within the constraints which we know on the reheating uh, scale, basically from 10 to power 10 GeV to 10 to power uh, 15 GeV. Yeah, that's Thanks. Thank you. Uh, No, no. CP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the presence of magnetic field will automatically uh, 
uh, we have not looked at the that uh, uh, that uh, problem which uh, you are asking uh, in the sense we have just tried to show that if there is a magnetic field then it can create a baryon symmetry in the, but uh, those details we have not looked at. For example, the later uh, in the uh, there could be some is fill around washout. So those things we have not uh, looked at in the in this model. So it's a, a simple model in the sense uh, we have uh, also we have assumed the instantaneous reheating. So yeah. So I don't know in the sense. Hi. Uh, what is the baryon symmetry violation? The source of baryon symmetry violation. Source of uh, baryon symmetry violation is the presence of uh, gauge field, the electromagnetic field. Okay. So if we have a electromagnetic, uh, uh, the magnetic field or the gauge field which has a uh, non-helical in nature, non-helical. For example, if we have a in this relation, one. So, if we have a helical magnetic field, then a plus is equal to a minus. The both modes propagate. Uh, both modes have the same propagation. In that uh, case, we have a zero chan Simon number density, and that since the chan Simon number density is related to the baryon number density, okay. that will be zero. And if okay. that is zero, which means that n b minus n bar, which is the uh, difference between baryon number and anti-baryon number, that is zero. Uh -huh. So with the non-helical field, we won't uh, have any baryon number violation. OK, thank you. But with the helical, we can achieve that uh, violation in this. in the. Hello? Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a work we did uh, last year with my PhD advisor, there, uh, Diana Lopez Nacil, in collaboration with Federico Urban. Okay, so probably what I'm going to show you here, what I'm going to talk, is about a model of ultra light dark matter, or spin two, or spin two, ultra light because it mass is very small and okay. um, if this model interacts with gravitational wave interferometers, we can detect its signal. So this is the task I'm going to show you now. Okay, so um, the spin two model, I always no. The equation of state for this model is like uh, the equation um, of motion, sorry, the equation of motion for this field is like uh, the equation of motion for the scalar one, except that now we had uh, two index, but it's totally analogous. And we're going to focus on astrophysical scales and in this regime in which the mass is much larger than the Hubble uh, parameter. With this, uh, we obtain a solution that is an oscillating one in which the oscillation uh, is given by the mass. That, that means that the frequency of the field is given by the mass. Here, what I want to remark is this uh, epsilon aj, which accounts for the five polarizations of the tensor, which is massive. That's why we, we have five polarizations. 
Okay, so two things I want to remark on this model is that, uh, as I said, the frequency is given by the mass of the field, but uh, mostly it remains coherent, given that the coherence time is pretty big. But also this field is uh, homogeneous, given that the de Broglie wavelength is also pretty big in compared to the, the scales we are going to be interested in. Okay, so I talk about the model, but I didn't talk about the gravitational waves uh, we are going to look at. So most of us uh, are most used to, to hear about the, the detection of gravitational waves coming from, for example, binary black hole uh, merger, which are like strong events in the sense that they are very, uh, very uh, few in time. You know, like the chirp mass um, are peak. And they are very strong in the sense that the uh, strain is of order 10 to the minus 21. But besides these uh, events that can detect, there are also another signals that can be used to detect gravitational waves as these that are known as continuous gravitational waves. Instead of being very short in time and very strong, they are weaker, but they are uh, coherent over a longer time. We are going to focus and we are going to use this kind of waves, continuous waves. Okay, so how do we expect the signal to be? In order to do that, okay, in order to do that, I'm going to present the interaction term that is going to account for the interaction between the model, the, the field and the gravitational wave interferometers, which is uh, that way. Here, MP is the Planck mass, the reduced uh, Planck mass, and alpha is the strength of the interaction. What is interesting to note is that we can uh, make a change in the frame in order to absorb this interaction. There. In order to absorb this interaction, so now we redefine the metric and we obtain no interaction at all, but instead now the propagation of the information is given in a metric that oscillates, and that oscillation is given by the uh, tensor field. So now, the metric perturbation, which is this part, and I call HAJ, is given by this term of here. So now, what do we see, or what does the um, detector of gravitational waves see? Well, the detector sees the uh, response function, which is defined this way, contracted with the um, oscillating of the metric perturbation. So what the detector sees is the, uh, I mean, what is called the signal, is the contraction of the uh, response function, the AG, and the contraction with the metric perturbation. Okay, so in terms of this, we define the effective theoretical strain amplitude, which is defined as the average over polarization angles and random phases, which came from the tensor field. And what we do now is to compare this theoretical signal that we expect uh, with the design sensitivity of uh, different uh, gravitational wave uh, experiments. Okay, so what we get is this plot, which I'm going to explain right now. So note that the signal that we expect is inversely proportional to the mass. So those lines over here are the theoretical strain that we expect because we are in a log, log plot. So this signal is plotted by different values of alpha, 10 to minus 4, minus 6, etc. And what we show here are different, um, different experiments such as LIGO, Einstein telescope, etc. And I'm not going to explain all of this, but I'm going to focus only on one, which is this one, which stands for Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo. Okay. Oops, spoiler. <laughs> okay, so what this plot says is the following. So take, for example, the strain we expect from the value of alpha 10 to the minus 4. For this value of alpha and this mass, or this frequency, it's analogous, for, the, for what we have right now in the detections of Hanford, Livingston, Livingston and Vargo, we can detect a signal coming from this 
tensor field. For example, if we expect Lisa, Lisa, I don't know how to say, it. Lisa, Lisa, to be this, uh, this signal, then we are going to possibly detect or constrain dark matter signals coming from this range of masses from these values of alpha. Okay, so that is what this plot means. And now, yes, thank you. <laughs> Actually, here, oh. okay, okay, yes. I introduced it as a, as a coupling strand, but actually it's a parameter of the theory itself. Yes. yes. I, I can explain, but this region over here is excluded by uh, Shogawa fit force. So we, this is the, like the most stringent constraint. We already use it. Yeah, in previous work, we used pulsar terminal array to, to constrain this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, you showed the coupling, yeah, um, between the matter sector and your spin two, but um, what about the, the action for the, for the spin two only? How do you? The action for the spin two? Yeah. Well. That was another question. <laughs> the equation of motion is this, mm -hmm. which is similar to, to scalar. But if you want to get that, you need to start from a theory, and this is where you can get it. It's like a first Pauli mass, mass term, mm -hmm. like, uh, which has this form. This so. tensor, epsilon j, well, mu nu, uh, has this form, which essentially look is second derivatives of the field, like kinetic term, plus the mass term. So the structure is the same as the scalar field or vector field, et cetera. But well, it's, it's different because we have more mm -hmm. Okay. But so. if you derive it from here, you can get the equation of motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks. Any questions from you? Is some parameter space uh, constrained by LIGO and Virgo? Um, something like this. I don't know if I get the question. Li uh, this is Stanford, Livingston, and Virgo. So this is LIGO, actually. The, the red one or the green? The red one. The, the red, red one. one. Oh, okay. Stanford, Livingston. I don't know if it refers to that, but. Okay. <laughs> Hello. I think. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this work. Uh, that is a collaboration with Matteo Biagetti, uh, Jorge Nareña, and Emiliano Cefusati, in which we try uh, we study the theoretical covariance for the wide spectrum, and we are interested in the squeeze configurations. So before to, uh, before to start, I'm going to give an introduction. 
So um, one of the main problems in cosmology is uh, have to do with the initial conditions of that is the structure formation. So uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So uh, inflation uh, provides uh, a mechanism to generate uh, the, the primordial perturbations. Oh, sorry. And uh, for example, single field inflation uh, that predicts that the initial condition were uh, Gaussian, adiabatic, and almost scaly variance. So all the perturbations are well described by the power spectrum. And uh, this model is uh, in well agreement, or I mean, it's consistent with uh, the observations of the CMB. But there are also another models that predict that the primordial perturbations are uh, not Gaussian, that uh, still are in agreement with observations. So we still don't know what is the, the, the model that, uh, of inflation. So what we want to do is to use the uh, statistics of the large scale structure to constrain uh, primordial no Gaussianity. Uh, for, uh, to do that, uh, we use the bias spectrum of, uh, of the, the galaxy bias spectrum that is a uh, good observable to detect primordial no Gaussianity. So we are interested in, in constraint primordial no Gaussianity of the local type. Uh, for which the bias spectrum uh, is sensitive in the limit when one of the when one of the modes is much smaller than the other two. So the idea is to improve the constraints from plant collaboration uh, by using the the, dat the data that is coming from the the new uh, from the upcoming surveys. So in order to get information from the surveys, uh, I mean to to constrain the theory uh, with the observations, we want to we need to compute observables with the same precision as observations. So we need a, an accurate modeling for the bias spectrum, and but also we need an accurate modeling for the bias spectrum covariance in order to uh, extract the information from the bias spectrum. So. Uh, for, for correlation functions as the power spectrum and the bias spectrum that depend on the scales, uh, the covariance is given in terms of uh, estimators of, of these observables. And in the case of, in the, case of the power spectrum, uh, the covariance is estimated uh, by using a large set of mocks. Uh, so many realizations are needed, but for the bias spectrum, uh, thousands of realizations are needed, so it is uh, computationally expensive. So we need uh, an accurate description of the theoretical covariance. So for that, uh, we need uh, the joint power spectrum by spectrum covariance. Uh, so we need to compute this, this matrix. And to do that, uh, so we consider that the measurements, <laughs> that uh, the measurements are made in, in a box of large, of uh, with a size of uh, L. So we divide the, the box into bins, and we, so we compute this uh, device spectrum and the power spectrum in Fourier space. Uh, each bin is an spherical shell of, uh, centered at K and with, um, with radius delta K. So for, to compute the covariance, we use these estimators where uh, the sum runs over all the modes that are into a, 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 bin, a, a K bin, and this NK is the number of modes inside the bin, and this NT is the number of um, triangles, of fundamental triangles inside the bin. So we use these uh, estimators to compute the covariance, and uh, in this case, we are uh, neglecting the connected part of the covariance, so we are only taking into account the disconnected part. Or for the bias, for the power spectrum, for example, we only consider uh, the terms that that correlates modes with the same size. So uh, in the previous slide, uh, can, can you go to the? Yeah. So one of the sums is uh, one of the deltas is the Kronecker. Yeah, delta. this is the Kronecker oh. delta, and we need Thanks. three deltas for the bias spectrum. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so uh, for the cross covariance, uh, we correlate a, a triangle and one mode that has the, uh, the same size as one of the sides of, of this triangle. And for the bias spectrum, we consider the Gaussian part that is given only in terms of the power spectrum that correlates triangles with the same size. 
Uh, this is the usual term that, is you, uh, that people use when you have a few number of simulations. But we are also here studying this term that is a no Gaussian term that correlates uh, triangle, triangles that shares one of the modes. So usually uh, the, this not Gaussian term in the cross covariance and this not Gaussian term in the Y spectrum is neglected, but we are, we are going to study what happened uh, for these terms and the squeeze configurations. So to do that, uh, we, we compare, uh, the, we estimate the magnitude uh, of the no Gaussian terms with respect with the Gaussians term and uh, for the Y spectrum in this case. So we, we, we conclude that when the scales are comparable here in the Y spectrum, uh, this, uh, the no Gaussian term is irrelevant with respect with the Gaussian term as is, it is um, suppressed by the dimensional power spectrum. But when we consider a squeeze configuration, it can be of the same order as the uh, Gaussian contribution when, uh, when, one of the, when the mode that is uh, shared here is a low wavelength mode. So, that, so for that squeeze configuration, uh, the no Gaussian term is relevant. <laughs> okay. So the, these no Gaussian terms are important for squeeze configuration. So we compare with uh, Quixote simulations with the Gaussian initial conditions. And then we compare uh, with the covariance computed from the from simulations and using the model. So we can see that when we, we only use the Gaussian term, there is a 100% error. While if we consider uh, the, oh, the full model with the no Gaussian terms, the error is between the, in the 20%. So we can see also here that for a squeeze configuration, if we only consider the Gaussian term, uh, there is a one one order error, while for a normal triangle, it is enough to use the Gaussian contribution. And we also uh, want to know what happened for the off-diagonal terms, so we compute the correlation matrix, and then we can see that there is agreement between simulations and the model, and also it's, it's agreement for when the load mode is shared. So we can conclude that the these node Gaussian terms are important for the squeeze configurations, so uh, they are important for uh, parameters that are sensitive to the squeeze configuration as the amplitude of local no Gaussianity. So here we use uh, EO simulations that have no Gaussian initial conditions to uh, co compute the uncertainty in measure uh, this parameter. So we can, uh, we realize that, uh, ah, sorry, that there is a, um, a degradation of the constraints if we use the whole model with the no Gaussian terms. So for that reason, it's important to stay That's it. Thank you. There is an important question in the Zoom. Is there any restriction on the number of modes? Yeah, uh, yeah, the, actually, uh, uh, when uh, you, when we compute, uh, yeah, <laughs> because uh, because of the delta function that says that the triangle must be closed. So uh, into the bins there are modes, uh, tri fundamental triangles that does, does not that does not satisfy the triangle condition. So. Um, we need only to take into account the ones that, uh, that, that satisfy the condition that there must be a closed triangle. So these are the... Nobody has other questions? We can just have a five minutes break before the next speaker. Many thanks again. <laughs> You said five minutes, right? Five minutes. Uh -huh. 
I can't. I, I, we can barely hear you. Alejandro, can you yes. hear us? Yes, I can hear you. you, you can okay, can you speak a bit louder? Yeah, let me get closer to the microphone, maybe. Can you hear me better now? Yes, but could be even better. Okay, let me try to speak louder. Can you? Hey, now, now it's better, right? Can you hear yeah, me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so shall I start? Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. I'm Alejandro Pérez Rodríguez, a PhD student at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, and I'm going to talk about uh, the formation of primordial black holes and gravitational waves from dissipative effects during inflation, which is the topic I'm currently working on together with my PhD supervisor, Guillermo Ballesteros, and other collaborators. Before starting, let me give a brief recap on the basics of primordial black hole and gravitational wave formation. If we have a peak in the primordial power spectrum at a certain scale k, then we will have an enhancement in the density of primordial black holes at a certain mass one-to-one -one related to the scale of the peak and the density of the gravitational waves at a certain frequency, again, related to the scale of the peak. Further, assuming a Gaussian distribution for the fluctuations, a certain value for the critical um, overdensity for the collapse and the reentry of perturbations during radiation domination, we know that for primordial black holes of a certain mass to account for the totality of dark matter, we need a peak in the power spectrum of order 10 to the minus 2, which according to current constraints is only possible in this window of masses here. And furthermore, the corresponding gravitational waves to this kind of peak uh, have the right amplitude at the right frequencies to produce a signal potentially detectable by LISA. Right, so let me now move to the basics of dissipative effects during inflation, which arise when the inflaton field couples to radiation under some technical assumptions coming from thermal field theory. At the level of the background, this coupling simply induces an extra friction term in the Friedman equation for the inflaton. However, at the level of the perturbations, things are more complicated. We get extra perturbations due to the radiation terms in the energy momentum tensor. And on top of that, the fluctuation dissipation theorem introduces stochastic transfer terms between a scalar and radiation perturbations, which at the level of the equations of motion translate into stochastic sources. Uh, just for the record, there is a, a, a particular case of these dissipative effects, which is the warm inflation framework in which this kind of dynamics has, have already been studied and I cite here to recent papers on the issue. So our objective is to compute this quantity here, which is the thermally average primordial power spectrum for which essentially we need to know this, right? And we have to compute it from these equations here. And in order to do so, we have explored two mutually consistent approaches. The Fokker-Planck approach in which we convert a system of stochastic differential equations like this one into a system of ordinary differential equations, not for the perturbations, but for the correlations of the perturbations. And after solving them, we can recast them into this thermal average with which to compute the power spectrum. And the other approach is a pure Monte Carlo approach in which we randomize the stochastic source. We compute several times particular realizations of the perturbations and of the commuting curvature perturbation. And iterating and taking the average, we estimate this thermal average and again compute the power spectrum. Now we have found in our results uh, that both methods are, are nicely consistent. So with these mathematical tools, we can study specific models and a class of models of particular interest for the production of, of primordial black holes are those in which dissipative effects are only relevant for a few efforts, which I have marked with this uh, blue shade here, right? In which dissipative fri friction dominates over Hubble friction. At the level of the background, the phenomenology is rather intuitive. We have that the kinetic term of the inflaton is suppressed due to the extra friction and the radiation energy density is enhanced due to the extra dissipation. And at the level of perturbations, we get using either of the methods shown before, this kind of power spectrum, which has every feature we were looking for. It matches CMB amplitude at the right scales, and it has a peak of order 10 to the minus two. And furthermore, we can tune the position of the peak uh, by shifting sidewards this strongly dissipative region. Just a detail, this uh, yellow or orange region here corresponds to the scales of the modes crossing the horizon during the strong dissipative region. So we could, we could stop here because we, we have a primordial power spectrum with all the, the features we were looking for, but we wanted to further understand what is the physical origin of this peak. 
And in order to do so, we perform an analytical approximation of the problem. Now, I, I cannot enter in the, in the technical details of how this approximation is, is performed, but uh, it, it suffices to know that it allows to, to decompose the spectrum into two components, one of which is due to the homogeneous evolu evolution of the perturbations, that is, the left-hand side of this equation is equated to zero, and another contribution, which is a, a purely thermal contribution that comes from the, from the stochastic noise introduced by, by thermal effects. If we compute the power spectrum in this analytical approximation, we get a result as this one here. You can see that it does not totally fit the numerical result, but that is to be expected because of the many simplifications that, that have been made in the middle. The, the, the relevant thing is that it, it catches the main qualitative features. And from here, we can, we can use some interesting physics, which is that, so these are the evolution of three particular modes for the perturbations corresponding to these scales in the spectrum. And if we, we focus on this mode here, which crosses the horizon during the strong dissipative uh, region, we see that the source term, that is the, the term due to the thermal noise, becomes dominant and it, it is uh, heavily enhanced and it brings the modes to a thermal attractor, which largely enhances the value at which they freeze outside the horizon. And this is precisely the physical origin of the peak in the primordial power spectrum. And it has nothing to do with the homogeneous dynamics of the perturbations. And well, in, in, in these papers here, they have performed um, particular cases of the calculations we have done and the res our results are consistent with theirs in the, in the appropriate limit. So let me just finish with a summary of the main points. Uh, we have seen that dissipative effects during inflation introduce uh, quite interesting physics at the perturbation level. They introduce a degree of randomness due to stochastic dynamics, which again, again are due to the thermal noise. And this thermal noise leads to a thermal enhancement of the modes of the perturbations. And if we design our model such, such that only certain modes are enhanced, for instance, having a short, a strong dissipative period, we can produce a peak in the primordial power spectrum whose phenomenology is well known again, the production of primordial black holes who could account for the totality of dark matter and a stochastic gravitational wave pattern potentially detectable by this. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So in the power spectrum, you have the peak around uh, k is equal to one mega per second inverse, right? Well, the peak in the primordial power spectrum in our model, we can we can fit it uh, freely because it's just a function of where we put the strong dissipative friction. So if, if I can share a screen again, let me show you. Um, yeah, so that will uh, determine the mass range uh, of the PBH. Exactly, exactly. There is a one-to-one -one relation between the scale of the peak. But if you have a peak around uh, this scale, uh, that shall, uh, shall that have any effect on the CMB uh, temperature, temperature, and isotropy? Uh, no, 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 because uh, at CMB scales, we have taken care of uh, being consistent with current observations by Planck. So this is purely, an, so CMB scales are not here where I signal them, they are like far. Uh, oh, so roughly, uh, okay, okay, right. Okay, so roughly what I want to understand is that what is the allowed mass range for your model uh, for the PBHs? Yeah, so this one here. So for the 10 to the 20 grams uh, more, so they are like very, very light black holes. Okay. In, in, primor in, in solar masses, it's 10 to the 15, 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 15, sorry. Okay, so, so that will be quite a large K, I think, not, uh, okay, fine, understood. Okay. Are the scalar perturbations at the peak uh, Gaussian, the sourced ones? The sourced one, okay, so, um, here, right, the, the source term you mean. Uh, we have not really studied the, the non-Gaussianity of, of these models, but, um, okay, so the, the thermal fluctuations we have considered uh, are, are classical. So we, we have not really entered. So we, we have considered that the, the, the inflaton has its standard uh, quantum fluctuations with the bunch Davis vacuum and everything. 
and a similar Gaussian. And then we have introduced uh, um, a classical thermal noise, which we have not quantized in, in this calculation so far. Yeah, because I would imagine perhaps it remains classical, but this is quite important, as you probably know, for the amount of primordial black holes. So the statistics of the perturbation is rather crucial for the total amount of PBH. Yes, what, what we have seen in, in one plot I have not included in, in this presentation is that um, when you compute this using the Monte Carlo approach, you can get like uh, an, an empirical distribution of the perturbations for each value of the, of the commoving scale. And in that case, uh, you see that the distribution of the, of the fluctuations is clearly non-Gaussian. But again, that distribution of fluctuation is taking into account both the quantum fluctuations of the inflaton and the, for the moment, classical thermal fluctuations. So we, we have not really disentangled uh, where the non-Gaussianity is coming from. So uh, I have a question. Uh, in this plot, uh, did, did I understand correctly that you are solving your stochastic equations in two different ways? Yes, to obtain this power spectrum here, uh -huh. we are using two numerical approaches, which is the fokker planck approach and the Monte Carlo approach. So you are approach. showing only one of them or what? No, no because the, the, the result you obtain with both is the same. It's okay. Perfectly the same. And then there is this third method here, which is an analytical approximation, which you can see does not render the same uh, result quantitatively because it's an approximation. Uh, but qualitatively, it catches the main features and it, it allows to make this physical interpretation of what is the precise origin of the peak. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next is speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. There, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now it's better, I guess. Okay. Well, uh, hello everyone. Well, first let me thank the organizers for this uh, space for sharing uh, my work. Um, today, um, well, I'm Raquel Galasso Garcia. I'm uh, uh, working at the uh, EPHT at uh, Paris uh, Sacle, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, self-similar solutions for a fuzzy dark matter. Uh, okay, well, uh, we have uh, rich evidence that uh, dark matter exists, of course, mainly of uh, its gravitational effects. And uh, with all of these evidences, uh, cosmologists uh, said that uh, the, the model called lambda called dark matter to describe the, our universe. However, uh, even uh, if uh, this model success got a lot of success at uh, uh, large scales, uh, it has some tensions at small scales, and then the preferred scenario since the 80s, which was uh, the WIMPs, has still not been detected, so this has revived interesting alternative scenarios, including the possibility that uh, dark matter could be associated with a scalar field. And the point of uh, these scalar field dark matter models is that are able to form equilibrium configurations, say called solitons, that manage to solve uh, 
some of the CDM uh, tensions. Well, in, in terms of the solitons, here I mentioned, I plot this um, plot uh, just to illustrate the Karkos problem, which is that in uh, numerical simulations of what I call dark matter, we predict that uh, the, the dark matter density distribution inside the galaxies is uh, so cuspy, whereas the observations say that in in indeed it's uh, so flat. So in the sense, you can think about these kind of solitons like um, with physics by hands, like kind of a hydrostatic equilibrium between gravity and another kind of pressure, which is the quantum pressure, if only we consider a scalar free dark matter model without uh, any other interactions, which is with uh, the model I'm going to talk about it today, which is fuzzy dark matter. So uh, also in fuzzy dark matter, we consider that uh, the mass of the scalar field is around 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. So uh, a tiny uh, mass, so um, I don't know, ah, okay, here, like here. Um, okay, so, um, well, I'm going to focus here, since I don't have too much time, in that uh, we can describe the fuzzy dark matter model as a fluid. Uh, well, we start with an action, okay, with a field minimally coupled with gravity, and also we have the standard kinetic term that we need to, uh, that this color field uh, behaves like dark matter. So then the questions you see in uh, uh, one, well, the model transformation, we have the continuity Euler and Passion equation that indeed um, are so useful because in cold dark matter we uh, use these uh, fluid equations to describe the dynamics of dark matter. But here I uh, want to uh, highlight that we have an extra term, which is the quantum pressure that uh, is given by uh, uh, this, uh, this expression that um, encodes uh, this uh, epsilon that in somehow it mimics the H bar, which means that when we are near the semi-classical limit, we recover a, um, the cold dark matter distribution, whereas if wave-like effects are important, we will have a different uh, phenomenology. Uh, okay, so here is just to illustrate uh, which are the difference between fuzzy dark matter and cold dark matter. Um, well, here is in a larger scale, so as you can see, uh, with fuzzy dark matter, we uh, recover the success of the larger scale distribution. Of course, the, the two panels are different because here we have quantum pressure, and what, we happen, what happens is that we have, uh, a, well, a smooth uh, distribution, whereas in cold dark matter, since there is nothing that can balance gravity, we have uh, this um, more a, a clumpy behavior. So now, the motivations of uh, self-similar solutions. The idea is um, first go beyond these static equilibrium configurations, which was the solitons, by investigating dynamical self-similar solutions. Uh, then uh, uh, the idea is to understand physical processes as gravitational cooling. So here uh, in this uh, well, here, over there, uh, it's a slice of uh, one numerical simulation that I have done in the term of uh, the phase space distribution, well, excuse me, phase space distribution, uh, time round like this. And uh, what we can see here is that we, if we start with uh, a scalar cloud, which is a bit perturbed from the equilibrium, we can see that there is here with this kind of ejection of um, a scalar matter, and this is uh, named as the gravitational cooling, so in other words, it's like a kind of mechanism that the system uh, has to go to, to reach uh, the, the equilibrium. So, uh, well, in order to have uh, yes, this uh, with analytical expressions, this is the motivation of this work, and of course, another motivation is uh, to understand uh, how are uh, these self-similar solutions in fuzzy dark matter compared to the self-similar solutions that uh, are in a uh, cold dark matter. Okay, so now I will go super <laughs> fast now. So we will work in the fluid picture. So the objective is we use the self-similar ANSAT, which is this one, and then we plug that into uh, uh, our equations, uh, 
our equations of motion, and we describe our fields uh, well uh, with, uh, well, we are going to study perturbations around the expanding background. We use the entire decision universe because it's convenient, because it's, uh, well, the scale factor is Apollo, and also it describes well the, um, the um, dark matter, well, the matter here. So this is the scaling variable that uh, we found that as you can see, there ha it has different behaviors uh, from um, the, the link with the uh, moving and uh, a physical coordinates. So I'm going to focus only in the nonlinear uh, regime of, uh, I mean, uh, the result for an over density, uh, which is uh, 100 uh, from uh, the background. Sarah. Okay. Well, just let me show you here that uh, here in this, uh, if we adopt an, uh, a Lagrangian point of view, which is just uh, to follow uh, a mass shell, we can see that a mass shell inside a perturbation first start in this uh, central peak, and then we have this kind of three uh, well distinguished um, velocity steps that we can see here in this uh, uh, field um, plot and then uh, it goes uh, to the Hubble flow. So, and I let uh, this slide of the comparison between cold dark matter self-similar solutions and the fussy dark matter ones uh, to conclude my talk. Thank you. So, on the slide that you've ended, so can you summarize in a sentence uh, what the comparison between CDM yeah. and FDM Yeah, is? well, the point is that um, in FUSI, uh, FUSI dark matter self-similar solutions describes this uh, gravitational cooling effect, which is uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, that the matter uh, well, it's inside the density perturbation and then will goes, uh, well, it's a, a blow up instead of uh, the gravitational collapse that describes a self similar solution. Another point is that in cold dark matter, we have a transition between the linear regime and to the nonlinear regime. So we start with a small perturbation, and uh, because of the scaling, it can read the nonlinear regime. Whereas in fussy dark matter, if we start in the linear regime, we cannot read the nonlinear regime. So in that sense, the um, we cannot describe the structure formation with this kind of uh, self-similar solutions if we see dark matter because of this. Um, so I would say it is uh, to... So it's not as simple as saying the caustics in CDM are just washed out in Sorry? FD. So in CDM, there are caustics in the self-similar solution mm -hmm. where the density spikes. Yeah. Uh, so it's not as simple as saying that only at the locations of the caustics, I have some kind of smoothing because of the quantum nature, and then in other places, uh, things are more mm. or less. It is not like that, you're saying? No, it's not, uh, okay. it's not, uh, it's not mm. like that. I mean, here, uh, I am showing you in this plot uh, how are the, the trajectory uh, of a, a sub-similar solution in cold dark matter compared to the trajectory in, um, mm -hmm. in fussy dark matter. Can I ask yep. one more, or? Maybe we can discuss later. Yes. Sorry, there is a question about magnetohydrodynamics, but I'm not sure if we can. If we answer Another question, can generate cores at the smallest scale? I suppose you said that... Uh, if we... Sorry? Can we, can we generate cores at the smallest scale? In this with scenario. these uh, self-similar solutions? I well, this the, the question is this. Well, in, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in fussy dark matter, the idea is that we can form solitons and uh, demand a core, a flat density profile at the center. So the answer for, is yes, that within this model, uh, yes, we have a flat uh, density uh, at the center, so yeah. These are cosmological 
uh, self-similar solutions. So also we study if these cosmological self-similar solutions, it's a kind of, a, the, the soliton is kind of an asymptotic of this, and the answer is no. I mean, the, we cannot describe this with a, the similar solutions cannot describe the soliton. That doesn't converge. Thank you. Okay. So the next talk is from. Wait, let me. From Sina Ho Shangi. Good afternoon, my name is Sina. I'm a PhD student uh, at IPM Tehran, and uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, work. <coughs> uh, the pointer is. Okay, uh, we know that large ray fluctuations that can, uh, <coughs> that, uh, can be generated during inflation, uh, and when re entering the the uh, horizon after inflation during the radiation dominated era, uh, if the amplitude of uh, fluctuation is greater than th uh, threshold, uh, the mass inside the horizon will collapse uh, to form a primordial black hole. Uh, uh, since in their nature their, uh, these fluctuations are uh, large, we need non perturbative methods to explore the tail of uh, the uh, the tail of the distribution of the uh, fluctuations. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on uh, probability distribution function for curvature perturbation zeta uh, to calculate cor uh, correctly uh, the mass uh, fraction or other related parameters for uh, primordial black hole. You need uh, the PDF for compaction uh, function or density uh, perturbation as uh, nicely discussed in the following references. Okay. Some non-perturbative uh, formalism were introduced uh, to explore the tail uh, non-perturbatively, such as a stochastic inflation, where uh, in this paper uh, they showed, uh, uh, sorry, the pointer doesn't work. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, in uh, where in this paper they showed uh, uh, the stochastic effects leads to exponential tail for the PDF of the curvature uh, perturbation. Or in this paper, the first uh, bullet point uh, with a, some quantum uh, uh, interaction and writing down the wave function of the universe uh, non perturbatively, we have uh, this behavior for the tail of the distribution. Uh, in our model, we use the, uh, the classical delta uh, formalism. Uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, now we, need, uh, we have the tool to explore the tail uh, non perturbatively. The, na the natural question uh, come up uh, uh, that uh, can we have tails uh, th that decays uh, more slowly than uh, exponential take uh, that I'm going to answer. Uh, this question. Um, mathematici mathematicians uh, call this uh, distribution heavy tailed uh, distribution. There is a formal mathematical definition which intuitively says that uh, this tail function, the, the capital F, uh, decays more uh, slowly than the exponential function. Since this, uh, uh, checking this uh, definition may have challenges for our numerical ca uh, calculations. We provide a practical definition. We calculate this function d, uh, and uh, we said uh, we say uh, a row, a PDF, uh, is practically uh, heavy tail if uh, this d goes to zero for large values of uh, zeta. 
Uh, here, in this slide, I provide some examples of heavy tail distribution. Uh, the first one is uh, log normal distribution. This is Levi distribution. And the distribution with this behavior at their tails, like uh, exponential of x to the p with exponent uh, p uh, between 0 and 1, or uh, parallel uh, behavior, are uh, according to both def definitions, are heavy tailed uh, PDFs. OK. Uh, uh, we assume, uh, in our model, we assume that inflaton undergoes, uh, at some per uh, period during inflation, uh, undergoes this uh, uh, potential. We use uh, the delta N formalism. We uh, solve uh, numerically, without any approximation, uh, the Klein-Gordon equation uh, governing the inflaton with this potential. And derive the uh, number of efforts that takes uh, the inflaton field uh, with, uh, from the initial perturbed field values to end of this phase uh, with n as a function of delta uh, phi. Uh, according to delta n formalism, we can calculate zeta as a function of delta uh, phi uh, uh, by, uh, by this uh, equation. Uh, some uh, people usually uh, expand the delta N relation uh, up to linear order and second order, uh, and which uh, leads to Gaussian and exponential uh, PDFs, uh, exponential tape for their PDFs. To calculate the PDF, we use the conservation of uh, uh, probability relation uh, I uh, mentioned uh, here. But here we uh, keep the delta N relation uh, nonlinearly, and uh, we see that the behavior of the tail is a uh, power, uh, power law. Here is the result for some uh, parameters we choose. Uh, the green uh, plot is the Gaussian uh, p uh, PDF derived from a linear approximation. The red one is uh, exponential uh, derived from a second order approximation. And the blue one is uh, fully nonlinear PDF uh, calculated with these uh, 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 parameters. You see how the nonlinear change uh, changes the uh, behavior of uh, the tail. OK. Uh, here we calculate uh, the function uh, d as a, uh, versus a zeta. And we see the, uh, the, the behavior of the tail uh, goes uh, like power law as, uh, for large values of zeta. And here we have uh, the parameter beta uh, to estimate a mass fraction of zeta. And you see uh, orders of magnitude difference between uh, the nonlinear uh, beta and uh, beta uh, calculated using the perturbative uh, treatment. Thank you. Can you go two slides back to the, the, the D? So I thought the D should be uh, non-zero for uh, heavy tail distribution. Is that right? Uh, no, or D should uh, goes to zero. For, uh, D for should go to zero for a for heavy, heavy tail, tail distribution. For heavy tail distribution, you see. Yes. I see. Okay. And what motivates the particular potential that you took to do these calculations? Uh, the potential. Uh, we uh, analytic, analytically shows that, uh, okay, we need a power law tail. We requ require a power law tail. And uh, we show analytically that uh, this potential uh, will give uh, uh, the power law tail, but uh, we do it uh, in inverse direction and uh, solve the client order equation uh, and drive the power law tail. I didn't get something simple. Uh, so it's so it's a two field model, or this is the inflaton? Uh, no, one field. Phi bar is the parameter. Uh, parameter. So it's only so single it's a, field. It's a yes. single field model. Yes, yes. Then I have to ask you later. I think they have a period of fast what the ultra is the. Yes, this phase is uh, the parameter chosen uh, to uh, be this uh, to this phase to be non-attractive phase. Yes. Maybe on Zoom. 
。哦。Is n of phi also polynomial or more complicated? Uh, no, uh, this is a complicated uh, function. Is thank you. Thank you. So can proceed with the last but not least presentation by. Uh, Rajul Hake. So here you have your, um, your pointer. pointer. It, takes, uh, it takes a bit this to go ahead and mm -hmm. turn back. Yeah. Hi everyone, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, look, okay. So the, thank you for the thank you to the organizers or organizers to giving me the opportunity to talk here. So here is the topic of my talk for that the gravitational duty, which is based on this archive number. And this work is in collaboration with my supervisor, Dr. Dev Prashamati. So first of all, I uh, mainly point out two, uh, two things, that how the present state of the universe has been created. And in order to do that, we basically emphasize that why the reheating phase is important. And the secondly, uh, I, I, I talk about the if uh, is there any possibility to reheat the universe through only gravitational introduction. Okay. So go to my next slide. So what is the difficulty in probing the early phase? Because your, our knowledge about the cosmic history of the, sorry. Uh, cosmic history of the universe is based on the two major observations. One is the cosmic microwave background, and the other one is the BBN. The CMB basically predicts that uh, there should be an early inflationary phase, and uh, the energy scale is of order of 10 to the power 15 to 10 to the power 16 CV. And in the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, it predicts the quantities such as the light element, and uh, the energy scale is of order of 1 MB. So there is a massive gap, gap in terms of energy and the time scale between the inflation and the BBN, which is basically poor understood from both theoretical and the observation point of view. And here the reheating dynamics basically lies. And why the reading phase is important? Because after the end of the inflation, the universe is cold, dark, and dominated by the homogeneous inflaton field. And so we basically need to get a thermalized radiation dominated state to, for nuclear synthesis. That's why we basically convert the inflaton energy density into the daughter fields to get a radiation dominated part. And here the reading dynamics basically lies. So this is the schematic diagram of this evolution of this uh, co moving Hubble radius. And, uh, this is the reading phase interpreted between the inflation and the radiation domination. So we need to understand the how this the modified expansion history is influences the predictions for the cosmological observables, like the CMB observables, the NS and R. The <coughs> okay. Okay, now go to the, the uh, it is important for doing this reading dynamics, the inflationary parameters, which basically says the initial condition for the heating. So these are the total parameters, the if the the epsilon and the eta, which is basically the first derivative and second derivative of the potential. And another important thing is the parameter is the uh, e-folding number during this inflation era and the inflation energy scale. And it, it, it can be connected the, uh, through the R and AS, or the tensor to scalar ratio, and AS is the amplitude of the scalar part emission. And, 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 and NS and R can be related with the total parameters in this function. And the end of the inflation is uh, set by epsilon equals to 1, and which gives the initial condition to the uh, reading dynamics. <coughs> OK, so go to the, the, the standard reading phenomenology. In the standard reading phenomenology, either we're doing the parametric resonance or the resonance production uh, during basically the preheating era, or we can do the perturbative decay. We can consider any uh, cup, uh, coupling between non gravitational coupling uh, between the inflaton and the daughter field in this, uh, in this way, and uh, we can uh, reheat the inverse. But here uh, in this work, we basically emphasize the fact that how the only the gravitational interaction is sufficient to produce this, uh, uh, re to reheat the universe. 
and this is the gravitational interaction, the one of our MPH mu nu d mu nu term. And the initially thought as it is a Planck mass suppression, so it is thought that it always uh, thought to be the gravitational uh, uh, this uh, process will not enough to uh, reheat our universe. So, but 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 in our case, we, we see if we consider the higher equation of state is the, if the inflaton equation of state is greater than wanted, then somehow we are able to achieve the radiation dominant universe only considering the gravitational interaction. Okay. So this is our the set of the framework. We basically consider the STL scattering between the STL scattering in the, uh, uh, scattering production of the standard model or the dark matter from the inflaton uh, uh, through the exchange of graviton. And this is the uh, use of Boltzmann's equation or describing the different energy component. This is the inflaton energy density, this is radiation, and this is the dark matter number density. So here, uh, in our framework, there are only three parameters. One is the inflation energy scale. Another one, the inflaton equation of state, which is connected with the exponent of the potential. Because if you consider the phi to the power twin kind of potential, then using the Virial theorem, the, if you average out those oscillations, then it's easily connected uh, uh, through this omega phi is n minus 1 by n plus 1 for phi to the power twin kind of potential. And another parameter is the mass of the dark matter. And the total radiation decay width is depend on the, the gamma s, gamma f, gamma chi. This is the, basically the scattering rate. Uh, well, scattering rate from phi phi to scalar, fermion, and for gauge motions. <coughs> okay, so now go to the next slide. So, what are the initial condition and the constant? First of all, the initial condition of the inflaton energy density is basically set by the inflation energy scale, which is the end of the inflation H end, basically set the uh, rho phi in, and the rho r and rho dm, the radiation energy density and dark matter energy is at the initial time zero. Then secondly, we consider the, uh, the constant from the entropy conservation. If we uh, consider the standard consideration that uh, duty, at the end of the reheating, all the entropy are produced, so uh, uh, all entropy are generated, so we can, we, we can consider the co-moving entropy density is conserved from the end of the reheating to the present time. Then, <coughs> then we can uh, relate this reheating temperature to the present temperature in, in this way. And for a particular CMD scale, pivot scale, 0 0.05 mega per sec inverse, we can connect this reading temperature with the present temperature through epoch by epoch. Okay. And, uh, and another constant is uh, coming from the, the present dark matter ambience, which is 0 0.12. And there is the uh, limit from the minimum value of the reading temperature, that's much greater than the BBN temperature. And the upper limit is set by the R and AS bound, and which is basically the 5 into 10 to the power 13 GB of the run off. Okay. So go to our results. So first we considered, uh, without specifying any model, we consider only the pseudo inflation. And this is the two important parameters find out that, uh, that describe the reading time range. One is the duration, this a folding number, and the reading temperature, which is uh, find out at the end of uh, this reading phase. And is the co this is the expression for this co-moving number density at the, of dark matter at the end of uh, heating. And how our gravity, uh, this gravitational heating model basically predicts this dark matter sector that mass will, uh, will be within 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 8 GB for fermionic dark matter. And for bosonic dark matter, it's of the order of electron, for 52,000 electron volt. And similarly, for inflation, uh, in, inflaton sector, the inflaton equation of state be lies between 0 0.6 to 0 0.9. So we, we have to consider a stiff equation of state. And the energy scale is of the order of 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the 13 GB. Okay. And, so, and inflation inflaton number must be lies between 60 to 63. Uh, 62 and 63. Okay. So the two numbers are for the two choices of the equation of the state? No, no, no. The equation of can be varied from uh, 0 to 1, but we see if we equation of state from 0 0.6 to 0, 0 0.6 to 1, then it successfully reheat the universe. Otherwise, the reheating dynamics always the sub, uh, reheating uh, gravitational production always subdominant for the equation of state less than 0 0.6. Okay. And this is the prediction from the primordial gravitational wave. If we uh, consider the uh, primordial gravitational wave prediction, uh, uh, and the, if we consider uh, gravitational wave uh, produced from, uh, during this inflation, and we, if we evolve uh, the tensor perturbation during the different eras and uh, calculate at the present time, then you can see for uh, those modes which entering during this reheating phase, basically from uh, 1 to 10 to the power 11, uh, this frequency range, this motor entering during the reheating phase, for equation of state greater than one third, there is a tilt in the spectrum. And, uh, this is the index of the spectrum. And our gravitational model only satisfied if this equation of state is nearly equal to kinetian. Otherwise, it is violated the BBN uh, constant. Okay, just one minute. 
okay then uh, then he considering the specific model here he considered the alpha actor term model and in the alpha actor term model uh, he had al he changed the alpha parameter and uh, this is a result for different alpha value then we see the how the alpha actor term model lies in the gravitational heating scenario in the nsr plane and we see only in the one sigma range only alpha is equal to 10 marginally satisfied the result the, so for alpha is greater than 10 it is disfavored from the planck observation And here the, this is the last slide. Here we compare the gravitation dating scenario with the case where the explicit coupling is present. And if you consider different explicit coupling between the inflaton to the daughter field sector, and you see uh, that for a sufficient range of the coupling parameter, our gravity, uh, this gravitation dating model actually dominates. But if we consider the sufficient high uh, coupling parameter, then it take over uh, this rating. So these are the main points. Uh, so main points are that we, uh, we uh, it's a model dependent, model independent approach, and we get a precise cosmological prediction. And here we switch up all the possible, uh, all the unknown parameters, all the couplings between inflaton sector to other sector. Only consider the gravitational introduction. And here uh, this our uh, this gravitational dating predicts the very narrow range of dark matter mass, low temperature, no reheating temperature, and the gravitational spectrum, which is, uh, indicates the stiff reheating equation of state. And this scenario basically discard the large number of inflation in models also. It looked to me that you were looking uh, two into two scattering. Two into two scattering process and exchange of graviton. Can you can you can you just go back to the start? Okay. Uh, yeah, right. When you look at the process, uh, you one. don't have a process where a single inflaton decays. No, no, no. But then you cannot get rid of all the inflatons, right? No, no, no. Here, here, here. If we if we consider the equation of state higher than 0 0.6, then it manage to decay, because the equation of state is inflaton equation of state is oh, higher no. than the reduction equa oh, equation okay. of state. So some amount produced uh, during the initial time of reading, but it dilute fast. So we at some point we get the radiation dominating. Okay, I see, I see. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, there is a question in Zoom, um, which is one of the initial conditions that you considered was rho dark matter equals zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so while rho present is a finite number, does this mean that reheating process synthesized dark matter? Actually, dark matter uh, produced from the scattering of the inflaton. So the initially, the dark matter is no dark matter. Dark matter is abundant is zero. And the finally, the, the present, we have to produce the sufficient amount of dark matter to satisfy the present relic value. Okay. okay. Thank 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 you.